Lord, Heavenly Father, just thank you. Thank you so far for uh, the baptism of Graham. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and grace on us. Thank you for your word speaking into people's lives. And Lord, we now as we actually look at your biblical word, we ask, Father, that you will speak into our lives. Restore hope in us, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, two weeks ago, I preached and we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Can we remember? Can we remember what we learnt? Could you... Your excuse then, John, you weren't here, it's true. You was uh, representing us at Haven Green Baptist Church, helping them out over there, so thank you. John's off the hook. But, <clears throat> anybody else? You sure. Uh, that women were not supposed to take over the church service. And um, he was still talking about the use of spiritual gifts in the church. Thank you, Marcy. Yes, women are not meant to take over the church service, but they're also not... They are not meant to be silent, neither. It's a whole... Read that. Yeah, I'm not going to go into that again. Because I'll probably upset somebody at some point. Anybody else? It was about tongues and prophecy and the, where they were abusing tongues, thinking they were highly spiritual people because they could speak in tongues. And they thought they've almost reached this sense of spirituality. And Paul is saying no. And it was bringing back to the concept of order in worship order on a Sunday morning. Uh, is this making any sense? Anybody starting to remember this? Okay, that's brilliant. I know some of you are here because some of you actually came up and, and said, thank you. So, but I do need to make a slight clarification from last time. I, uh, my fault entirely, there's nothing worse than when you know what you're talking about, but then you somehow slipped into the the language that you wasn't quite meaning. Uh, I had a member come up to me quite rightly after I, I preached and said, you may remember I quoted from Gordon Fee that said, spiritual edific edification can take place in ways other than through the cortex of the brain. I then just kept talking about God bypasses the brain. I removed the cortex bit. Cortex for those who may want to know, is responsible for your intelligence, your language, your memory, and your consciousness. And I was talking about the fact how God can commune with us spirit to spirit, spirit, Holy Spirit to our spirit, and he bypasses the cortex of the brain. This was in relation to speaking in tongues or any spiritual relationship. But I kept then afterwards saying just brain. And your brain does more than just function via the cortex. And if I'm saying he's bypassing the brain, then he's bypassing the person, which wasn't what I was getting at, because you have to be consciously aware of those some people. Uh, anyway, so I want to clarify that. There's various reasons behind that, but just clarify. It's the conscious level. Do you remember it was about the fact that prophets, prophets are actually in control of their own tongue? Prophets are actually in control of the spirit of prophecy and this whole concept of just like well I couldn't help myself uh, uh, the spirit just took me is actually a misnomer we actually we have got the ability to suppress the Holy Spirit just thought I'd mention that so just want to clarify it was the cortex of the brain not just the brain as a whole you with me yes one we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 15 now there's 58 verses did I hear a lot of whew, whew, perspiration kicking off already? The issue is, a lot of it, we already know. The vast majority of us in this room know and live this now. There's also a lot of these verses that we use here, actually, within part of the gospel, trying to portray uh, the gospel uh, within a, a funeral service. So, as much as I want to skip chunks, we're not going to. We're going to read them, but I'm not going to just unpack every little verse because we would be here until the end of the year. And it doesn't seem to be particularly necessary to us. So, this whole 15, which wasn't chapter 15 then, it was just part of a whole letter, but it begins with, let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters... 
So this is now Paul needing to remind them of why they really are together. What is the primary purpose? And we don't quite pick up why until verse 12. Then we understand why he's written this chunk of the letter. Verse 12 is this. But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? So he's battling some false teaching that appears to be going on, which seems to be virtually all this letter is about in one respect or another. So what Paul then does in this chunk that we're going to look at is actually refute. So as those people saying there is no resurrection of the dead. These are Christians. They're saying there is no resurrection of the dead. Just for a minute, how does that make you feel? Okay, just hold that for the thought for a moment. So Paul now goes through argument of logic as to why to refute their to refute that teaching, to say that is wrong. And we're going to go through that, but I'm not going to do it all unpacking it bit by bit. But first, let us look at verses 1 to 11. Uh, Timmy is going to very kindly uh, go through that as I read. Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. For I am the least of all the apostles. In fact, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. But whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out his special favor on me and not without results. For I have worked harder than any of the other apostles. Yet it was not I, but God who was working through me by his grace. So it makes no difference whether I preach or they preach, for we all preach the same message you have already believed. Made sense? Right, verse 12. That was a bit of a joke. Well, I'm going to pack it slightly. Paul needs to remind them the reason why they're together as a church, reason why he preached to them, why they believed. And in this verse 2, he says, well, as long as you stand firm in what you believe that I preach to, you're going to be fine. But if you suddenly realize you didn't believe that, or it's something that wasn't true in the first place, then you cease to become believers in Christ. It's fairly obvious, really. If you cease to believe that actually what Paul had taught you, that the resurrection, the death and resurrection of Jesus, then you actually cease to become believers in Christ. The fundamental key of our belief is that Jesus died on the cross, yes, and the most important bit, though, was that he was risen again. Yeah. Don't believe that. You're not a Christian. It's a fairly fundamental bit for me. Verses 3 to 5, where he says, I passed on to you that what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. So notice he's saying, I passed on to you that I believe was important teaching. It was passed to me. And three to five would appear to be some sort of early church creedal form, a statement of faith of what they believe. Like how God is good all the time. There it is again. It's that same sort of thing. So if you look at that, when he makes it very clear, Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. Scriptures being the Old Testament. Isaiah and all around there about the Messiah dying. He was buried. 
There's a truth. He was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. Notice how Paul's linking it all back to the Old Testament scriptures to help give them the bigger picture. He was seen by Peter and then by the 12. Now that's the best bit. That's like eyewitnesses. That is them remembering whom saw him. Peter. Nobody's going to argue with Peter, especially the Corinthians. They like Peter. There's a chunk of them that like Peter. He was seen by Peter and then by the 12, the other followers of Jesus, the immediate close ring. So they've got an immediate statement of faith and a belief and a proof. Why? Because we can name the witnesses that saw him resurrected. I just get that. That's written here. This letter was written AD 51, AD 52. Within 20 years of Jesus' death, uh, ministry starting and death and resurrection on the cross. So those people who have seen Jesus are still alive. It means you could have spoken to them about it 20 years later. Heard their story about how they spent time with Jesus. What they'd learned. What they had witnessed on that cross and subsequently what they witnessed three days later. Just, just, just for a minute. That's quite something. Wouldn't you love to speak directly to somebody like Peter? It's one of those key questions. If I had a time machine, what would I like to do? And so many people say, oh, go and see the future. Or, or some people say, go back to key events in the past. I've got to say for me now. It used to be, oh, I want to see the creation of the world. But no, you're right. That looks a bit dangerous. When you think about it in hindsight, think, yeah, there's not a safe place at that moment. No, you're all right. I would like to go back to that moment. Not the crucifixion, not the resurrection. I'd like to go back within those three years. Listen, actually, to Jesus' teachings for myself. Would you not? No? Oh, well, I get revved up about it. Anyway, that's the point. So people could actually um, pick up on that. They could speak to people. So this is part of this whole thing. They'll say, and we have witnesses to this. And in those times, you had to have two or three witnesses to back up a story. So here's Paul saying in the church creedal, don't panic about it. We got Pete and we got these 12 others. But he doesn't stop there. He says there's 500 other people that Jesus appeared to. Most of whom are still alive back then. Not now, by the way. And I just, oh, that's just a sense of me of, Whoa. could you imagine wanting to take your family member or your friend along and you want to prove them that Jesus is alive and you say, well, let me just take you along to this chap here. Hi, welcome to Tobias. Tobias, I'm just making that name up. Tobias here. Why did I get that? Oh, yeah, I watched the film Divergent yesterday. Tobias here. I'm just trying to think, where did that come from? Tobias here actually saw Jesus after the resurrection. What would you do then? You want your family member or friend to be bombarding them with questions, wouldn't you? So Paul is saying, there's some of you don't believe in the resurrection of the dead, yet clearly there's a bunch of these witnesses. Oh, I just, I got excited. Anyway, verses 8 to 11. Last of all, as though I were born at the wrong time, I also saw him, says Paul. For I am the least of all the apostles. In fact, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted the church. But whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out his special favour on me and not without results. For I have worked harder than any of the other apostles. Yet it was not I, but God who was working through me his grace. First and foremost, he's given a quick synopsis to emphasise the fact that his status is an apostle. But it's done with real humility. Firstly, he's not worthy to be called an apostle because of the way he treated the church. B, he said, though, I've worked harder, but notice he said, it's not really me that did. It's actually God working through me that made me work harder. But what does he also mean by that? Well, what does he mean by about born at the wrong time? Because he was clearly around when Jesus was around. Now, this might be where it comes just a little bit upsetting for people. So please bear with me because you've got to try and understand that Paul is quite robust in his language and his description of things. And we've got to also understand 
that today we have completely different medical services to they had back then. The reason I'm saying that is what he means by this is the Greek probably means something along the line of uh, like I've been aborted or a miscarriage. I was born prematurely at the wrong time. So he's sort of saying, well, I was come at the wrong time into knowing Christ. I, I am clearly something that shouldn't have existed here because of the way I persecuted the church. He's having a go at himself and the way he was. And there's almost a view of it, and this is my own makeup. This has not come from anybody else, but this is the way I picked it up. It's almost like he was saying, I was grotesque. Like a non-fully formed baby malformed by persecuting and murdering the church. That's the imagery I get that he's saying. I was so grotesque because of the way I persecuted the church. And yet, verse 10, the result of God's grace upon me, my thankfulness so much to what he's done through me, I am actually working hard to spread the gospel. I'm working hard to make sure that everybody else knows about this love of Christ, that anybody can be redeemed, no matter how bad you have been. His grace, he's picked up so much, the thankfulness. He's, he's so, oh, well, grateful to God. There's no way to describe it. He's literally just poured out his life before God and said, it is all yours then because you have transformed me. I literally have been born again. And so I'm working on I'm not going to sit on my backside and just soak it up and go, thank you. I'm actually going to work hard so others hear the gospel message and turn to Christ and they become transformed no matter how bad they are. Just think about that for a minute. That real grace. We talk about thanking God. We praise God this morning. Some of us are on the knees, etc. and saying, I give it all to you. Paul really did give it all because of his thankfulness to what God has done in pouring out his grace on him. Can I say the same? Can you say the same? It's about the outworking of your, your faith through the thankfulness that you have to God for what he's done in your life. It is not that you gain favour by God from God by your works. It is actually work because of the grace and faith that you recognise that's been poured out upon you. Do you see the difference? Which is what James goes on about in the letter of James. And yet Paul still says, but it's not me. I'm working hard because of my thankfulness, but it's God that's sustaining me. It's God that's driving me on I'm not on my own amen so just think a minute how thankful are you how thankful am I truly thankful that I know that I have got a secured hope I have been transformed because of God's love for me and nothing for what I have done And in verse 11, he emphasizes the fact that actually he may be the least of the apostles, but he's there with the apostles, and it makes no difference whether they're preaching or he's preaching. We've all preached the same message to you, death and resurrection of Jesus. So he hasn't quite picked up why they've sort of the resurrection of the dead bit seems to be dropping off. And we'll take it from that. So here we go. Verse 12, the crux of the reading. But tell me this. Since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? It's not making sense now. I've told you that Christ was rose from the dead. Why are you something thinking that none of you are going to be raised from the dead? And this is the key problem. They didn't have an issue with the fact that Christ had risen from the dead. What that somehow not seemed to have translated to some of the Corinthian church is actually means you will be raised from the dead. That seems to be their problem. So how can we best do this? Well, from now 12 to 19, there is now Paul almost going through a logical argument. 
And I don't want to unpack these. I'm just going to read them through. But I'm going to do it a bit like... Um, it's almost like being in a court. You're going through the logical argument with someone as to why you've got to prove to them that their end conclusion is incorrect. If anybody's here a lawyer, I'm about to apologise now in advance. Uh, my lords, may, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, may I have your attention, please? There seems to be a problem that within this court at the moment, there are some that believe there is no resurrection of the dead. I just wish to go through some logical arguments with you. For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless. And, my Lord, and members of the jury, your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the dead. But that be can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. Are you with me so far, Your Honour? Are you with me, Jew members of the jury? And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. I'd just like that to sink in with you just for a moment. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. Your Honour and members of the jury. So I'd like to say, why is the Corinthian church now existing? And you are all truly guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. All our fellow church members, all of our relatives, all those who believed are confessed in Christ. If you do not believe, members of the jury that Christ did not raise from the dead, and that you won't be raised from the dead, then you're not going to see your family members ever again. I just wish to prove this to you. Think about it. And the worst, the most damning thing, my Lord, is if our hope in Christ is only for this life, if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. I would just like to say, in my closing remarks, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. Amen. Amen. The point is, the end argument for them and for us, if Christ really wasn't raised from the dead, that means we're not going to be raised from the dead. If we don't think we're going to be raised from the dead, then Christ wasn't raised from the dead. And if that's all that, then this is complete futile faith that you've got. The whole crux of our faith is the fact that Christ was raised from the dead. Amen. That we're going to be raised from the dead. Amen? Amen? If you don't believe that, you have no hope. What is the use in living this life? And this is what gets me with the secular society. And this whole concept, there is nothing beyond today. Because how are you going to bother living? It's a waste of time. Sorry, it's something that really gets to me, as you can tell. <sighs> So you see, just as death, verse 21, came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Notice Paul's very much into order. Order in church service, order in the creation. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all, then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. You're meant to be living this hope. When you hear the words that you will be raised to life when he comes back, you're meant to go, yeah, that hope's in here in my heart all the time. That's what drives me every day. That's what makes me get up on a Monday morning. That's what makes me go to work or whatever university. That's what makes me live my life for him is because I know that I have a hope where I'm going to be raised to life. After that, so after Christ has come back, the end will come when he will turn the kingdom over to God, the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. For Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. 
For the scriptures say God has put all things under his authority. Of course, when it says all things are under his authority, that does not include God himself, who gave Christ his authority. Logical. Then, when all things are under his authority, the Son will put himself under God's authority, so that God, who gave his Son authority over all things, will be utterly supreme over everything, everywhere. Death was never part of God's original plan for us. But Adam, or Adam and Eve, is you and me. It's a representation of you and me. We have all sinned and gone against God. It's very easy to blame Adam and Eve in Genesis. The point of that is actually to say, no matter who they were, it could have been trying to think of a random female name that's not in this room. <laughs> that's not going to work. Okay, it could be Warren and Eve. How's that? There you go. It can be Warren and Eve. Do you understand? I haven't remarried another woman called Eve. Joy's still my wife. So, but the point is, it makes no odds, whoever it was, we would have all turned. We would have all turned against God and gone our own way. We would have gone our own way in matters of living our lives for ourselves, in our own selfishness, our greed, our lying, our anger, our choices in life. All of us. Even, quite frankly, when we think we're doing good to someone, I can guarantee you there's an element of, oh, that's good because it's going to make me feel good. There is a sense of that selfishness. That is a selfish gene that's within us. Gene. Mm, no, no. That's just the selfishness in us. So we brought sin into the world. We broke creation. We brought death. We have to take ownership of that, whether we like it or not. There is only one perfect human being that walked this earth. And his name was Jesus Christ. But Christ brought life into this world. Verse 22 states this. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. Graham, until this morning, belonged to the heritage of the line of Adam. Like we all do or did. So effectively, Graham belonged to death. But his life was going to lead to death, as mine did at some point as well. But because he's now decided to follow Jesus, he gave his life to Christ. His pathway now leads to life. And it's life everlasting. Yes, he will physically die. But he will live. And that offer is open to anyone. And of course, in this passage, as we know, when will we be raised to life? Well, when Jesus returns in majesty and glory. This age will pass. Time will stop as it is today. Who wakes up every morning or goes to bed most mornings thinking that tomorrow is going to come naturally? You just assume it's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. We almost think, well, as much as the sun is going to come up and the moon comes up and the sun goes down, that's how it's always going to be. But that's not true. There is a point that Jesus is going to come like the thief in the night. That does not mean, by the way, he's going to come in the night. Because one half of this planet is in night and the other half passes is in daylight. And when he returns, the whole world's going to know about it. But he is going to come back. And we're meant to be living like Paul did, which is so thankful for the grace poured out. He's striving to make sure that everybody gets an opportunity to hear the gospel. And when Jesus returns, he will defeat the final enemy, death. Note that it's death he will finally defeat. Not Satan. He's already been defeated. Okay? It is death. 
And then when that's happened, he'd effectively hand back the management of authority. Because at the moment, Jesus actually has full authority over creation, over us, over the universe. Do you understand that? He's actually managing everything. Everything's through him at the moment. But when he returns, when he, everything's wrapped up and finally, he will effectively hand it back. Now it says in here, God. And when Paul mentions God, what he means is, he's God the Father. And he'll hand it back to the Father. And everything will go back to him. Do you remember I've said to you that, if you may remember, I said God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all have, are all God, but they have different functions. You remember that? I gave you a very quick Trinitarian theology. They're all, you know, there was never not a father, there was never not a son. They're all God, but they all have different functions. Well, eventually, at some point, what's going to happen is Jesus returns back the full function of everything back to the Father. But at the moment, he's effectively managing it at the moment, like what we were meant to do back in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve were given full dominion over all of creation. They were told, go and manage it. But we screwed it up. Notice I said we. But Jesus being the perfect human, the perfect, is able to manage it correctly. And that's what he's going on about here, about finally defeating death and coming back. He gives it back to the Father. Verses 29 to 34. If the dead will not be raised, what point is there in people being baptized for those who are dead why do it unless the dead will sometime someday or rise again okay before i go into the rest of it, let's unpack that one verse 29 because that really on a surface reading would look like there is a practice going on that they baptized on behalf of those who already had died doesn't that look like that? I believe there are a uh, faith that actually does do that. Because of that surface reading, it's the, yeah, it's the Mormons. On the, Latter -day, the Church of Latter-day Saints do it. Because they believe that you could baptize on behalf of somebody who's already died. And that's their understanding, and it's come from that initial reading. But there's a problem with that for two reasons. We actually really don't know what Paul specifically meant, but there's one thing that we can unpack. It doesn't mean that surface reading. Because, first and foremost, there is no historical evidence that there was of ever a practice by the early church or by any other pagan religion of the idea of being baptized for the dead. There's no evidence at all, historical, archaeological, of that ever existing as a practice. And don't ever sit there and believe in some strange belief that the church picked up a whole new thing and did a whole new thing. A lot of the practice that they have then and what we have today has historically been picked up and changed and converted and giving Jesus honour. Like Christmas Day. That's coming, by the way. Just thought I'd upset you. It's okay. You know, at the end of the day, Christmas Day wasn't... Jesus wasn't born in the middle of winter. But anyway, another story. We just took the winter solstice and we decided to, quite rightly, give honour more to, to, to God through the birth of Jesus than, uh, than praising the sun. Now I've detracted myself. Two. So there's no historical evidence of that. Two. Paul doesn't quite appear to condemn the practice in this. He doesn't actually have a go at them. So if it was that they were baptising for the dead, we'd expect Paul to have a go at them because that's not what he believed. He very much believed that you have to make your own choice to follow Jesus and be baptised for him, as Graham did this morning, as we're going to have in a couple of few weeks' time with Judy and with Chris and with anybody else that feels like they want to do it. So what is going on here? What is he talking about? Well, you'll be really pleased to know there are 40 different explanations by scholars today as to what is meant here. Number one, that's like fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, isn't it? Eh? The two possible likelies are this. People were often baptised or made a decision to be baptised as a result of seeing a Christian 
die well, in inverted commas, or live a consistently Christ-like life before they're dead. So when they saw that Christian die, for them, that was, wow, I want that. They clearly had something. I want to be baptized. So really what the reading be better translated as is um, that what is the point in these people who are being baptized because of those who have died and gone before them because they respected uh, their faith and they wish to have that same faith and they want to be baptized because they want to see them again. Do you see the... Or the other one is that the baptism is with a view to, literally is to that. Sorry, that is the other thing. That baptism is a view to seeing those dead again at their resurrection, which would make more sense. You want to be baptized because you realize that this was the good life they led. They're going to be raised to life. So you want to be baptized so you can see them again. And so Paul's saying, well, but if you don't believe there's no resurrection of the dead, then that's a complete waste of time of you getting baptized now, isn't it? Do you see the, the argument? But the honest truth is we don't fully know, but it most certainly can't be that it's okay to be baptised on behalf of somebody else so that they are raised to life. That is not what's being said here because Paul would have condemned it if that was a practice that was happening. So if that's how you've always read that, I can give you the other 38 different explanations if you wish to. No offers? No take up? Okay. Okay. And then there are three more arguments why believing in, not believing in the resurrection of the dead is completely foolish for Paul. And it's this, verse 30. And why should we ourselves risk our lives hour by hour? For I swear, dear brothers and sisters, that I face death daily. This is at least certain as my pride in what Christ Jesus our Lord has done in you. And what value was there in fighting wild beasts? those people of Ephesus, if there war, will be no resurrection from the dead. And if there is no resurrection, well, let's feast and drink for tomorrow we die. Don't be fooled by those who say such things, for bad company corrupts good character. Think carefully about what is right and stop sinning, for to your shame I say that some of you don't know God at all. Paul does not pull his punches. Well, those arguments are, quite frankly, if there is no resurrection of the dead, if there is no hope, why am I bothering battling nasty people in Ephesus who have caused me nothing but great grief? Why do I feel like I am facing, and he was facing death all day long? At any moment, he could have been uh, killed because of his confessing in his faith. What is the point if there is no hope in a resurrection from the dead? So he's saying, ah, blow it. Let's just go and have a party. Let's just go and get drunk and let's do what everybody else does. That's what he's saying. If there's nothing beyond today, there is no resurrection, there is no hope, why are we bothering to battle it? Why are we bothering to confess the faith in Jesus and the grief, let's be honest, it brings us, amen? Why are our brothers and sisters across in different countries who really are facing death all day long? and are killed because of their faith. Why are they bothering if there is no resurrection? We don't get persecuted in this country. We get a bit of a rough time, but we don't get persecuted. And Paul is also saying, don't be fooled by those who are saying such things. You know, I'll oh, just go and feast and drink for tomorrow we die so he's saying because that's just bad company basically avoid the idiots who are saying stupid things Paul is actually not polite don't ever think Paul was like all warm and cuddly trust me he wasn't and quite frankly that's a good lesson throughout all life isn't it avoiding constant friendship with company of stirrers troublemakers and people who do not reflect time spent with God by the way, that does not mean you avoid non-Christians, but it does mean you just have to be cautious of where are you taking your advice from. Verse 34, when he says, think carefully about what is right and stop sinning, is actually sober up. Now, that's not 
don't drink alcohol. That doesn't mean that. It means become clear thinking. Be a bit more focused in your thinking. For some of you think you know God and his plan, but actually you don't. If you're preaching no resurrection and leading others down the same path, then you actually don't know God. So grow up, be ashamed of your behavior, and get your act together. That's his point. So he's sort of proven now there's got to be a resurrection of the dead because just you're taking God out of the element. If you don't think there is no resurrection of the dead and you don't understand why, you've taken God, the all-powerful God, out of the element. You're with me so far. So as I said, they don't have a resu- problem with the resurrection of Jesus. They have a proper resurrection of themselves. Isn't that quite strange, isn't it? So Paul's defeated the sort of argument of no resurrection of the dead. But if he said now the dead will be coming back, what their problem is, is what are we going to look like? Shock and horror. Maggots growing out of our noses? Will we be zombies? Difference between somebody in the ground for a day and somebody in the ground for 10 years? You can see what probably they're not understanding, are they? I know you're doing. Ian was an undertaker. And you can see some of the logic, but then taking God out of the element. It's like the argument, sorry, I'm just going to sideline, it wasn't in my planning, but I'm going to argue. It's like the argument between should Christians be buried or should they be cremated? And when you ask the question, they say, well, it's because if I'm buried, I know I can be resurrected in my body. But if I'm cremated, then there's no body for me to be resurrected in. At which point my argument is, what about if you're a Christian and you're burnt to an incendiary in a burning building? What's God going to go, no, I'm sorry, can't resurrect your body, You, you, you didn't get buried. Well, did you see the argument? You're taking God out, the all-powerful sustainer and creator of the universe that made you and me together. If he can do that, I think he can, you know, pull a few ashes together. And I'm not being flippant about it, but I, I can understand the debate, but quite frankly, God does work in order in some logic. Sideline. Verses 35 to 44. But someone may ask, who will be, who, sorry, how will the dead be raised? What kind of bodies will they have? What a foolish question. By the way, I just thought you'd like to know, it wasn't just nice and simple. What a foolish question. Actually, it was more like, I'm going to try and do this in the way that it's meant. Foolish man! It's that. That's the force behind his statement. The English translations like to try and keep it nice. But it's almost like saying, shouting foolish man, or just to balance out the gender, foolish woman! You're taking God out. Why? This is daft. When you put a seed into the ground, it doesn't grow into a plant unless it dies first. And what you put in the ground is not the plant that will grow, but only a bare seed or wheat or whatever you are planting. Then God gives it the new body he wants it to have. A different plant grows from each kind of seed. Similarly, there are different kinds of flesh. One kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds and another for fish. There are also bodies in the heavens and bodies on the earth. I'm just going to say this heavens, by the way, he means space. The glory of the heavenly bodies is different from the glory of the earthly bodies. And this is where it's clarified. The sun has one kind of glory, while the moon and the stars each have another kind. And even the stars differ from each other in their glory. It is the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but but they will be raised to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. 
They are buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. Paul uses nature to argue, for he knows it makes no odds uh, about who, how you're going to be raised from the dead and what your body is going to look like. I'm not into gardening, as it's well known. But my understanding is, when you put seeds in the ground, uh, apparently they sort of crack open after a while, they break and that comes this beautiful flower. Is that true? Well, I'm assuming so. Um, I, I see seeds in, in my house, and I see Joy put this sort of thing, about yay big, in the ground, and then all of a sudden out comes a beautiful flower. We have some roses in our garden. They're really lovely. I like roses. It's about the only flower I truly, 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 truly love. But strangely enough, we didn't just plant a rose, this big rose. It, it's sort of this little seed, which didn't look much like a rose at its time. Yet it sort of died in the ground and then grew into this beautiful rose. Yes? So Paul is using nature here to say, you put a seed in the ground, yet you did really nothing and out come this plant, piece of wheat or whatever else. This is what God can do with our bodies. And he uses the fact, the imagery of all the different kinds of bodies that are actually best suited to their particular environment. We have all different kinds of bodies. Um, we humans have got a particular look, haven't we? And then he sort of goes on about beasts, but he also goes about birds. Now, the last time I checked, my body, if I flap my arms, I don't fly. But birds' bodies are suited to their environment. They can fly. If I lose a couple of pounds, you never know. But when the birds fly, it's because their bodies are suited to that environment, isn't it? Fish. They can swim in the sea all day long, and they don't come up for air. Actually, they'll die if they try and come up for air for too long because their bodies are designed for living in the sea, yes? And they can sustain themselves. I would love to be like that. A couple of sets of gills here, I'll be well happy. But it's suited to their environment. So Paul is having a go and saying, well, yeah, hang on a minute. God's created all things. He's able to do what he's able to do to suit each environment. So therefore then, when our bodies are buried, or cremated, but when our bodies are buried, they might be busted and broken, but God is able to raise them up with a whole new body. And Jesus is the primary example of what that resurrected body is going to look like. And how it's suited to the environment of being the resurrected body. I'm, I'm going to be really cautious because it's this... Strange belief, well, I can't say why, that we're all going to go to heaven. That's where we're going to spend the rest of our lives. But that doesn't make sense in Revelation when it said there's a new heaven and a new earth. We're going to sort of reside, sort of the two are going to come together. And it's imagery in Revelation, granted. But I think, you know, if God created a creation originally and said it's very good, I think it's going to wipe it out. So we could be living on here. But anyway, but we're going to get a resurrection body. So if you look at Jesus' body, it was the prime example of what a resurrection body looks like. A, it was able to eat. He fed. B, he was able to walk on this earth, communicate and talk. C, he was able to appear in locked buildings, locked rooms, without coming through the door. Well, when he appeared to the disciples, he just appeared. They were in a locked room, and he appeared. So the resurrection body seems to be able to have this ability to, and I love this being a science fiction person, is able to actually sort of almost go through like some sort of portal, the mix between the spiritual and the physical, and is able to sort of walk in. Do you get my meaning? In my head, it's there. I, I can see it all, but I can't describe it to you. Watch a few science fiction programs, and you'll get it. Um, well, that's how I come to believe quite clearly in the Trinity. It made sense to me through science fiction. This is obvious. I don't know why people don't get it, but anyway. So, so that's what our resurrection bodies are able to do. Because they're suited to the environment that they will eventually spend the rest of their life in. And God does that, not us. That's the hope 
we look forward to. So it does actually mean, by the way, all your bodies that you have now are the building blocks for your resurrection body. Well, Jesus was recognisable. You can see the scars on his hands, his resurrection body. So the body that went into the tomb, or else the tomb didn't become empty, did it? So all to your bodies are the building blocks for your resurrection body. Think about the implications of what that means. But your bodies will be perfect. If they're able to do what they're able to do, they are. (gasps) Because there is no sickness, there is no death, there is no more tears. So therefore then if there's no sickness, your body can't get ill, can it? So I just thought I'd mention that as well. Before some people start thinking, do you mean I'm going to have that achy knee in my resurrection body? No. I hope not, anyway. I'm going to leave it there. Because, A, we're running out of time, but it's the perfect place to leave it. I thought it might be. What is the point of this passage so far? Well, hope. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is hope. Hope for today, hope for tomorrow, and hope for beyond. If you believe that this is all you have today, And this is it. And if you're watching this on the internet, if that's you, if you think this is it for today, this is all there is, you are to be pitied. When I hear people say that to me, ah, there's nothing beyond now. We've only got this life and then we die. My view is, then what's the use in living? Ah, so allow humanity to continue. Why? Why? Doesn't seem to be doing itself a very good, great deal of job at the moment, does it? Seems to be hurting each other constantly. Oh, there's a lot of love in the world, do not get me wrong. But we seem to be very good at hurting each other. What's the point? So, I want you to look in the light of your circumstances for yourself today. Maybe you are in physical pain. Maybe you are going through some real troubles. And the problem is that is doing this to you. But eventually, this is momentary compared to the glorious resurrection that you will witness and be part of in the future. Can you get that for a minute? There is a glorious resurrection hope that we do need to look towards. We don't ignore what's going on today, but we see it in the light of the hope that we wait for. Maybe you have relational difficulties at the moment. See it in the light of what you've got coming. Let's take a few moments just to reflect. Lord, as I I reflect on some of the conversations I've had with people who are not believers, about the whole concept of it's not possible, um, this future coming, But Lord, it more than saddens me because of the fact that there is a hope that they are just not seeing. And really something logical, which is God. Lord, I want to pray for each and every one of us here in this room, Lord, as we just sit here for a moment. Sometimes losing sight of the hope that we've got coming. Losing sight of the the excitement of we know what is awaiting us. Lord, I want to pray that you will touch those right now who have lost that sight of that hope.
Lord, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for what your son Jesus did on that cross. More importantly, Father, we thank you that you raised him to life so that he is the first of a great harvest of all of us who believe in you and been baptized. Pray as we walk out this week, Lord, that we remember to carry that message of hope for others who need to hear it. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you all. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.